Disclaimer. English broadcast doesn't support or deny any claim or statement endorsed or stated by the guests. The questions are framed only from a journalistic point of view and are not intended to hurt any community or religion or caste or creed or gender or ethnicity or any other categorization made under the sun. These broadcasts are made for entertainment purposes only. Warning. The content has disturbing topics like murder, cannibalism, necrophilia, etc. Viewer's discretion is highly advised. The officers told us that we had to evacuate the building. And I saw that, hey, there's a lot of police over in Jeff's apartment. And the first thing I said was, is Jeff okay? And one of the officers said, yeah, that is fine. TV, Milwaukee's 24-hour news channel. Very gruesome discovery in Milwaukee overnight. Milwaukee police find a horrifying scene inside an apartment building. Police got here in the middle of the night and what they found was an apartment full of pieces of people. 30 years ago, Milwaukee woke up to news. Jeffrey Dahmer was responsible for killing more than a dozen people. The majority of those murders happened in an apartment near the Marquette campus. So we thought it was a Steve Freezer. And now we found out he's got dead bodies in it. All that remains today of that site is a grassy lot. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered weak and weary over many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore, while I nodded, nearly napping, suddenly there came a tapping, as of someone gently rapping, rapping at my chamber door. Only this, and nothing more. This is a poem from the iconic, uh, King of Macabre, Edgar Allan Poe, and his poem, The Raven. Uh, in this poem, he tried to describe a ghost in the form of a raven knocking at the chamber door. But I want you to imagine for a second, close your eyes, imagine that there was no ghost, there was no uh, raven, there was a real guy knocking at the door. Now imagine the same guy killed 17 people ate some of them, and then kept their dead bodies next door. And then he knocked at the door. For a lot of people, that might not come true, thankfully. But you ought to be living under a rock if you don't know whose story I'm referring to. It's buzzing so much nowadays. On Netflix, uh, a dedicated series on him, a three-part documentary that's in, like, in the same ranks as the series itself. Hell, back in 2002... Jeremy Reiner, the Hawkeye, he played this guy. I'm talking about Jeffrey Dahmer, one of the most prolific serial killers in the history of United States of America, if not the world. I mean, there are a lot of keywords, graphic keywords to be talked about here. Uh, cannibalism, necrophilia, 
right, so viewer's discretion, again, is highly advised. What are we trying to do today? What we're trying to do today is not, um, you know, we're not going to uh, trivialize his crime. We are not going to try to understand what's going on uh, in his mind because I don't have that expertise. But what we're going to try to do today, understand the social, political, and economic consequences of his crimes around the community that surrounded him, also the people that surrounded him. To talk about that, I have a gentleman who is the literal neighbor of Jeffrey Dahmer. Well, was the literal neighbor of Jeffrey Dahmer. He passed away. But we'll come to that later. He wrote a book about him called Across the Hall. I read the book. It's absolutely phenomenal. I'll show you the cover in a minute. But before I go to him, I want you to understand that these are sensitive topics. And whatever we talk about, you ought to share this discussion with your true crime fans. So it is my honor to welcome to the screen Mr. Vernell Bass. Well, welcome, my buddy. Thank you for welcoming to your show. You look dashing. Uh, I try to. I, I try I, to. I saw you in the documentary, both your younger version and the older version that you have right now. Uh, you gave you stole the show, by the way. I don't know anybody told you that. You and that and that lady uh, who represented Dahmer. Yeah. First off, you know, tell us about the experience with the Netflix series. Uh, sorry, the Netflix documentary. I'm getting so confused nowadays. There's so many content on him. So, what? How did Netflix reach out to you? What was the experience like? Well, right now, living this experience with Jeffrey Dahmer in my book, Across the Hall. You know, it's kind of nightmarish, but then again, you know, it's something that I did and it's an accomplishment, accomplishment and a, green, a dream come true. And having Netflix contact me um, was awesome. You know, um, they treated me very well. The only downside is that um, there's parts of my story that when they edit it, that, that are in the book, that I think they should have talked about, you know, as which they didn't, that I feel that that needs to be known, you know, but for them to contact me and, and everything that they did, they treated me, they treated me with royalty. And I think they did a very good, very good job on, on the documentary. I think they did a very good job. I mean, there is so much content on Dahmer. I guess you, you would agree with that. His dad wrote a book on him. Uh, his classmate wrote a book on him, My Friend Dahmer, that later, uh, you know, was made into a movie itself. Uh, so many documentaries. What made you write this book? And what makes the book different? What made me write the book was that seems like every time I talk to someone, they would tell me, man, you should write a book. You know, everybody, man, when, when I'm done telling my story, you know, they should say, they, they would say, man, you should write a book, you know? And so I'm going to tell, tell you the truth because I want to keep everything real, you know, and let everybody know that I wrote that book while I was in the county jail. Wow. And I was, yeah, I was okay. sitting there. I was in the county jail and I was incarcerated and I was okay. sitting, they would let us out, out of our cells in the morning in the county jail where, where you have the, you know, where, where you have the, the entertainment room, you know, the playroom. Yeah. Right. So, so I, I ordered pads of paper and a few pencils and at night I would lay down and the only light that I had was coming from the, from, from the cell block, from, from the, from the light in the hall as the, as the officers would walk down the tier and I'd lay on the floor and I mm. sit down and I just, and I, and I sit down, I lay down on the floor and I decided to start writing, you know, and I, I wrote, I would write all night and then I would sleep all day only to get up to eat and shower. Mm. And so I wrote, I wrote my, I wrote my manuscript and I sent it to a publisher and they jumped on my story right away. But things happened where that book did it didn't get the it, it didn't fall through. And so 
that's what made me write the book. And that's how I wrote it, you know, and I had to, I had writing a book is not easy, you know, but I just want to, I just want everyone to know that if you decide to do something and you stay, stay with it, you can accomplish your goal. And right now my book across the hall was only in my mind. And right now I'm looking at it in my hand. So and please the, read, read, read the book if you want to know the truth. Absolutely. This is the yeah. cover of that book. Uh, you know, how did you come up with the, the design and all that? Everything was in your mind. Did you come yeah. up with the cover and, and you just yeah, gave yeah, it to the publisher? Yeah. The, the, the cover, the cover is, is supposed to be me looking out of my door through the peephole. Through the peephole. Yes. And I'm looking, I'm looking across the hall at 2.13. 213. So let me yeah. ask you this question. I mean, a lot of people, uh, I mean, I saw this, you know, YouTube video that other day. Uh, he was one of the serial killers who had groupies, right? Like yeah. Ramirez had and Dahmer had a Bundy had some groupies. Like, do you think that this, con like all the sorts of content made on him, the movies, the documentaries, the books, do you think it's some sort of like in, in a way trivializing his acts? No, no, I, I don't think that it's trivializing. I think that it's more so for them to tell a story. And at the same time, while telling this story, being that it's a topic of entrance, where it happened nationwide, where everybody knows about this, you know, so therefore they can make some money off of it, you know. So I feel that if you're going to tell a story, you know, try to be as accurate as possible. You know, try try to be as accurate as possible. You know, if dollars are involved, it makes sense. My, the only downside that I have about this is that the families should be compensated. Absolutely. That's what I think. For, for any proceeds, you know, something should be a set aside where where, where, where whoever, whoever's making money off of this, the they make money as well. But set something aside where where a budget is going toward the families and divide it among the amongst the families. That's what I think. I agree with you. I mean, that was one of the the themes of the the I think the series and the documentary. I think the series covered it quite well. There was a philanthropist. He was a millionaire, and uh, he wanted you know before people wanted to auction. Uh, yeah, the, yeah, 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 right, right, the, right, yeah, right, he actually, right. Get, got rid of him. bought it and destroyed it. Well, let me ask you something. Maybe you have something from him. Uh, maybe remember that sixty dollars that you talked about on the documentary that you, you know, he gave you. Yes. Imagine. Do you have that still, or is that is no, that I, 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 sp I spent that. I bought. I bought my sister a gift, and um. And and you know I really I, I man I got all dressed I had a tie I had my tie on my sport coat you know looking looking sharp getting ready to go to the wedding you know but bad times were were upon us and I really didn't have a gift to give to her and I knocked on the door and I asked him for twenty dollars to go buy her a gift I asked him what for twenty think? bucks to what loan me say? twenty to loan me twenty bucks. And he so gave me, not loaned me, he gave me $60. So he you asked me, for $20, he gave you $60? Did he, he say, gave me, say he it? He gave me 60 and said, buy her something nice. Wow. Yeah, so do, really you, do, you, do you think that they're like underneath all of that, I mean, he did have no, emo like, but we'll get, we'll get to that question later. But do you think that down there, there was a little bit of tiny sanity there that had a little bit of compassion. Do you think he was human? Of course, of course, man. He was my neighbor. You know what I mean? You know, he was my neighbor, you know, and, and, and we actually had a liking for each other. You know, it wasn't me always knocking on his door. You know, he would knock on my door as well, you know, to borrow, a cigarette, to borrow a cigarette. You know, one time he, he, he got robbed. He got robbed two times. The first time he got robbed, he reported it to the police. Okay, nothing was done. The second time he got robbed, he came to me, he knocked on my door right, right after the robbery. And he asked me, um, 
if 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 I could loan him loan him some money. I don't recall wow. the amount that he asked for, if he even asked for an amount. But he told me that he had just got robbed, you know. And I asked wow. him, didn't I asked him, did he call the police? And he told me, no. This is in my book. And he asked yeah. me, yeah. He I asked wanted, me, if I, yes. He I asked me, actually, if I, yeah. Yeah. Please go ahead. Yeah. He asked me if I asked him if he called the police, and he told me no because this was the second time that he got robbed, and the first time. They didn't do anything. And this time, the only thing that he was concerned about were his credentials. You know, he said wow. there was no there was no money. You know, the only thing he was concerned about was the credentials in his wallet. And, and why, unfortunately, do you, why do you think that was the case? Why do you think that was the case? Excuse me? Why do you think he cared about the credentials more than... Man, I mean, I mean, that's what you care about, man. Your ID, your social security card. You know things of that nature. That's what you care about. You know, especially if you didn't, if you don't have any cash. You know, you would hope that the individual that robbed you would at least take the time to send your wallet to you if he didn't find any cash. Knowing what you have to go through to get through to get this to get the identity and things that you lost. You know, from being stolen from you. But unfortunately, I didn't have any cash and I wasn't able to help him. You know. All right. but, yeah, but see, the way that the way that he came home from work, he would always come through. He would take the shortest distance, would be okay. getting off the bus on, on Wisconsin Avenue and then cutting through backyards and things of that sort to where he comes in through the back door. He would never get off the bus on 27th Street and just walk straight down a couple of blocks and then he's at the apartment. Coming through the back door was the way that he felt comfortable. So, I mean, it, it was kind of a shortcut. So he would you I, I don't know, maybe, maybe he walked from work. He was close wow. enough to where he, where, where he could walk, where he wouldn't have to take the bus. I wanted to show the the audience a glimpse of the book. Um, you know, actually, I had so many page, like few pages, I wanted to show to the to the audience. Please um, do. One of the, Please do. Yeah, yeah, one of the one of the you know pages, page number twenty eight. You had a conversation with Jeff about the burglaries that happen in the apartment so often. So he said, "Hey Jeff, we're uh, starting to look out for each other's apartment due to the break-ins. Give me your telephone number so that we can call you. Just let you know when we're going to be in so that you can keep an eye on your apartment." And then he said, "Vern, my phone was turned off because I'm having a hard enough time paying my rent and feeding myself so there is no reason to give me your phone number i do however intend to get a burglar alarm for when i'm away at nights working now this is an interesting conversation because we're talking about a serial killer being of you know afraid of his apartment getting burglarized imagine the shock of the burglar if he entered jeffrey dahmer's apartment he wanted a few dollars and he found a <laughs> yeah, that 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 would have been that 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 would have been super crazy, you know. Right. And I'm thinking that whoever was doing the burglaries, yeah, it was a it was an inside job because okay. that build that building was secure, and oh, the only okay. the only way that you can get in after after ten o'clock, I believe it was. Yeah, we we have a question all, with that. Yeah, we, yeah, we do want to. The doors yeah. automatically lock, you know, mm -hmm. and at that time we did not have cell phones. So let's mm -hmm. just say if you wanted to come visit me after mm -hmm. 10 o'clock, you would have mm -hmm. to call me from a phone booth or from mm -hmm. your home to let me know that you're leaving. And I would go and stand downstairs and wait for you, wait, wait for your arrival so I could let wow. you in. They, they, they wow. didn't have it where they, they didn't have an intercom system where you could push a button and buzz that person in. They didn't have wow. that. They didn't have that purposely. So let me ask you a question. I mean, since you mentioned his how how's God burglarized twice, was that around the time where you know he was killing people? Oh, 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 okay. No, 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 no. His house never got burglarized. 
Okay, so he his house never got burglarized. No, no, I think I think we had a burglary one time. Okay, so just and this was around the time that he was killing people when his apartment, you know, stinked. Yeah, 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 yeah. We 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 had a burglary, and I think my neighbor that was next door, he also had a burglary. Oh my god. So do you <laughs> This is this is very interesting what you're saying. I mean, I think the burglar didn't want to get inside Jeffrey Dahmer's apartment like well, because well, well, of this. Okay, well, okay, 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 listen, listen. This is what I think. This is my thinking. And I used to be a burglar. Okay? So okay. when you burg- when you when you're burglarizing somebody's crib, I mean, you you don't know who lived there. Okay. You know, but that's what makes me think that it was inside job. But I also have to consider that the doors were unlocked at that time. And okay. that was and that was a pretty nice building of, amongst the that buildings that, amongst that build the buildings that were in that area, the Oxford apartments were very, very nice. They were very yeah. nice. And, 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 and the rent was very decent. Yeah, around two hundred dollars back in the days. Or it, it was like no, that. no, no. Exactly. It was we we were paying two ninety five a month. Ninety five. All right. I read the book. It's mentioned two yeah. ninety five a month for an unfurnished apartment. That is phenomenal. They, they, they also had furnished apartments, and I'm thinking that Jeff had a furnished apartment to where his rent may have been a little bit higher than ours. Wow. Because he had a furnished apartment. Splendid, splendid. I, yeah, I see, a, lot, to, a, lot, you know, a lot of people don't know that. You know, he he may have added the fish tank, and and, and, and you know what you know whatever else you know the paintings on the wall. The paintings you know, on the I, wall. I, I, yeah. noticed, I noticed that when he when he when he when he stopped stopped dealing with me and and you know, started to avoid me, and then at the time of his arrest. I got to look at his look inside his apartment, and I saw that he had changed the paintings on the wall because it came wow. with, it came with wall decorations, you know. And right. and I had never been in his apartment to see where he had uh, pictures on the wall of men shirtless, shirtless men. You know, you know, flexing, and you know, he, he was whole, he was attracted you know, you know, to it. Sexy, you know, with the yeah. se- you know, sexual way. You know, he 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 didn't have that when I used to go to visit him, and you know, hang out with him. You know, did he did he did he did he hide that hide the? Okay, let me. I got so many questions I want to I know, ask let's, you. Let's, let's go. Let, let, keep, <laughs> keep them coming. Keep them coming. All right. So, for example, uh, one of one of this, um, you know, you know, paragraphs from your book, like. He went on to explain about like he means the manager of the uh, Oxford Apartments. This was around the time when you first bought the apartment, like the uh, apartment, right? He went on to explain about the front entrance door being unlocked at 8 a.m. and locked at 10 p.m. for security reasons. Any right. visitors after 10 p.m. or before 8 a.m. would have to call ahead to be let in by one of the tenants whom they were coming to visit. Now yeah. the question is, who was Jeffrey Dahmer calling to get his victims in and out? Okay, okay. Nobody would call him because he didn't have a phone. That's number yeah, one. Yeah. Okay. Right, number one. He he didn't have a phone. Okay. The way that he would bring his vis- victims in was through the back door. He would come through the back door. I don't know if you could show that shot, but he he would come through the back door up the iron landing. And yeah, that was a, yeah, yeah. So he he would never have to buzz anyone in, or I mean, go down and let anyone in because he would bring them in, and he would never use that front entrance to bring anyone to his to his apartment. He would always bring them through the back door. That way, no one would see him going to his apartment with a visitor. He was very clever. Wow. Wow. I, I have this question, uh, and I, I, there, is, there are so many questions. I, I, I don't know how can I collect my thoughts here. Take your time. In Take the, your time. In the, in the series, all the focus was on Glenda Cleveland. 
Now she is a real character. <laughs> She's a real character. She's the yeah. one who called uh, about Conrad and Thabsabo. And, you know, the, yes, the guy. She yes, she did. You know? Yes, she did. Yes, she did. You know, and, and being but and, you're and, saying and, that she, did she li live at the Oxford Apartments at all? No, she did not. Right now, I have I I don't know where she lived because I never met her or never right. seen her. And, and the only way that I know about her is from what be, what's being reported now, you know, considering that situation. But I can say that she did not live across, she did not live next door to him, and she did not live in that building. To my knowledge, she did not live in that building, you know? So as far as him giving her a sandwich, that never happened. That never happened. That never happened. Can you sandwich imagine? Sandwich never. You, huh? She. So he didn't offer any sandwich to anyone. He didn't see him offer a sandwich to you, to maybe another neighbor. He definitely probably didn't offer a sandwich to you. Probably. Man. Did he? No, man. I mean, dude, man. He he, he was like um, he was trying to. He he's not getting friendly with anyone. He, uh, would not, he, he was not getting friendly with anyone. And for them to suggest that he gave a sandwich or gave food to someone, I know where I know where that story came from. And they where? jumped on and they jumped on it. But I want to say did... that I want to say that it's not true. Where, where do you think the story came from? The sandwich? Uh, the story actually came from my ex-wife. Okay. okay. Do tell. Okay. Yeah, her name Pamela Bass, of course. Everybody knows her name. And just so that everyone that's listening and watching this is aware of the story of how Pamela Bass became known as she is from being a friend of Jeffrey Dahmer and being his neighbor. Um, it was a choice whether it was going to be myself or her who, who took the limelight. And I decided that I wanted her to do it. Okay, so she started. She her 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 picture was on the New York Times, and you know, saying a big picture of her on the front page, and she was really out there. You know, I mean, a limousine came to pick her up one time to take her to a studio, and and um, she was really living the limelight. You know, for being a neighbor of Jeffrey Dahmer, and and I noticed how when she started doing the programs on diff on these different uh, documentaries, that her story started to change, you know? And um, a lot of things that she, that she talked about, I had no knowledge of. And I was watching a show where she said that she took a sandwich from Jeffrey Dahmer. And so I was thinking wow. to myself, yeah, so I was thinking at the time when I saw that, you know, well, damn, where am I half? I mean, you know, <laughs> I mean, you know, you you give me a yeah, you didn't say me none. You know, I mean, you you never told me about this. You know, and I'm a little bit, I'm a little bit dismayed that she would even say that, because for anyone to take a sandwich from this guy's apartment, you would be, <laughs> yeah. I mean, come on, man, you're not gonna, you know, let's keep this real. You know, you, you're, you're not going to eat anything from this guy's apartment with, with the stink coming from his apartment. But did you, like, I, this this is what, how it's weird. Like, he had the same excuse again and again. My meat went bad. My meat went bad. My refrigerator ain't working. Yeah, yeah his freezer. His freezer. Freezer. Like, he, he, he told me that two times. Okay. Let me get the camera right. He told me that two times that, that his camera went bad. I mean that his freezer went bad, you know. And, and and the second time that he told me that, I started to wonder. The second time that he told me, you know, did, did and, you think? Did you think at that moment? Okay, this is a red flag. I know this is a red flag. This doesn't smell like you know, animals, road kills. This is the real. No, 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 no. It didn't smell like your your freezer going bad. You know, so, it didn't. So, yeah, you know, it didn't smell like your freezer going bad. That that it didn't have that smell. You know, the smell the smell would make your eyes water. Right now, 
never have never have smelled a decaying body a, a decaying body you know it's a smell that i would never forget so how is how was that like like a stink of uh like how would you describe the smell it would make your Fish eyes wa man it would make your eyes water okay it was, it was that bad it would make your eyes water and you know, remember when, when, whenever we would have a visitor come to our whenever i would have someone come to our our apartment i would right. light incense in the hall in, in the hallway and put it over all wow. wherever, wherever i saw a crack i would stick an incense you know and light it you know for the hall and then when when that person would come to when that person would come to my apartment if i had to go down go down to let them in on the way back when we got to the second floor we could use the stairs or the elevator you know i, I would always take the stairs you know i take the stairs you know okay and then walking walking to our apartment i would always apologize for the smell i mean yeah, it's, I would it's apologize written, written, for, over for the here, smell. written over here in the book as well i wanted to be shown at the apartment that we uh would be renting the manager said sure and then you went up you know you you bought the 214 jeffrey dobmer's apartment was 213 in the exactly. series it was it was shown like it was next to each other like there was no a no 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 I, I i watched that i, yeah. I watched for that and i looked for that and okay. they were correct they, they were correct when when you open jeffrey dahmer's door I saw right. my apartment 214. I saw it okay. across the hall. So so they were accurate in that in, in that in, in that part. But they wanted to show that their the neighbor that was complaining was not from 214. That was actually beside. Do you know the neighbor that lived, you know, side by side Jeffrey Dahmer's apartment? Let me think. Did he have any complaints of that sort? I think that back then it was a single woman okay in, in, in that apartment but she actually she kept to herself okay if she did if she if she did complain about the smell it wasn't to me she may okay. have meant to she she may have went to management like everyone else did and on the and, and on the opposite side of him there was a couple right you know but see but see in 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 that apartment in that apartment building everybody kept to themselves you know nobody inter intermingled with each other hmm. you know on the second floor everyone kept to themselves that's interesting i yeah. mean speaking no, of, speaking of keeping keeping uh, to oneself and this is another uh if if you if i can read this i have so many pages from your book i'm not going to give the entire book away it's a very phenomenal book i you know you wrote a book how many days did you take to write this book how it many took days me, you... I, i was in the county jail and by the time i finally got my manuscript together I think it took me 60 days, 60, 60 days, 60 days to write the manuscript. And then when I wrote the book, I had to rephrase the last mm. part of it because being incarcerated, I was stuck on the original manuscript was talking about how <laughs> me being locked up, you know, I was off into because he's white and I'm black. You know, they doing this to me, you know, when they should be doing this to him, you know. So I had I had I had to change I had to change it. You know, because I was stuck off into that. And then I took the I took my manuscript and I put it off into my mom's into my mom's um in, in, in inside of her in the bank um her safety deposit box. And it set my manuscript set for 11 years. It set for 11 years. Wow. And I went I, and I went through a lot, you know, I went through a couple of incarcerations, you know, and then um finally got my life together, you know, and got a job and found out what what it was actually what life was really about. 
and it wasn't about it wasn't about what I was doing. Do you think so, that this the incarcer incarceration and you writing the book, you pouring your heart out, this this sort of helped you deal with the trauma? And what was the trauma like? What was I know you were shocked. I mean, everybody would have been like, we'd be flabbergasted at, at this. But how did you deal with the trauma afterwards? I just keep going, man. You know, I just keep going because there, there are other things other than life that uh, other than going through. I'm not stuck with the Jeffrey Dahmer. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not stuck with that. I'm not stuck on that. You know, there are other things happening in my life. You know, I mean, I feel sorry for him because I knew him and he was a human being, you know, and I'm not happy with the way that he died. But the way that he did did die was to me was meant to happen. So I accept that. I accept that and I keep going. I keep yeah. going. I keep going. And right now, for anyone that's interested in knowing about Jeffrey Dahmer, you know, that segment of when he got arrested, I have the true story. You know, and I'm willing, I'm willing to share it. That's why I wrote the book. I'm not Did trying. I'm, I, I'm not trying to get rich or nothing like that. I just want to share my story. You know, at the same time, I feel bad for his victims, but Absolutely. I didn't know. I, I never met the victims. You, you know, the, the victims. yeah, I never met any of them. I see. I seen one of them one time. I seen one guy one time, who, and he who? Ended, he, ended up, he ended up being a victim. But I never oh, got. Okay. I, I never got to talk to him or anything I, I, like that. Are you talking about Dean Juan? I, I I don't know his name. I have to look at the pictures okay. to see. Yeah, to 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 bring back who I saw. I only saw him from a distance. But you did suspect this guy that was portrayed in the character. This is this is the character, Dean Vaughn, a guy who lived at your apartment. He ended up dying. And uh, police actually didn't charge his death to Dahmer. Dahmer actually denied his uh, involvement with this case. But you have your own theories. Can you let us know what that theory is? I'm glad, I'm, I'm glad you brought that one up because Dean Vaughn, he was, uh, I'm not going to, he, he was receiving Social Security. And he was the type of guy where everybody in the building liked it, Dean Vaughn. He was the type of guy to knock on your door and just start talking to you, you know? And at the end, at, at the end of the conversation, he would ask you for two bucks until, until the first, or five bucks until the first, you know? And everybody liked it, Dean. You know, and I'm quite sure that he knocked on Jeffrey Dahmer's door. I never can say that I've seen the two together. But knowing Dean, the way that I do, he was friendly with everyone in the building, a single guy living on the third floor. And if I'm not mistaken, he lived in apartment 318. So not in the same uh, floor? No, no. He lived, he, he lived above. He lived above. And... And 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 when Jeffrey Dahmer's killing spree happened, where he stopped talking to me, Dean came up dead. Okay. Yeah, Dean came up dead. Okay. Now, if you think about the security of that apartment building, you know where the doors are locked at certain times, and then you also think about Jeffrey Dahmer doing his killings. I'm thinking that that Jeffrey Dahmer went to Dean's apartment, which he has came to my apartment and knocked on my door, which was not, you know, not on you, un unusual. You know, this is my neighbor what, across, what, the, what, across the hall. Let me ask you this question, and this, this might sound a little spooky, but why do you think you were not a target and why was Dean a target? Dean weighed less than me. And at the time I look at my I look at look at that picture of me standing by the door, I look kind of thin, you know. But um the way I carry myself having been incarcerated, you know what I'm saying? You know, I mean, there's nothing about me sexy to a man. Okay. <laughs> you know, there's nothing nothing sexy. I, I, I have no feminine tendencies. On top of that, I think Dean lived alone, correct? Yes, and you he had did. the wife. 
you have yes, the wife. He, so he, maybe he that's alone. one of the reasons, right? Yeah, yeah. Had, had I come up missing, you know, Pamela, she knew all of my whereabouts, wherever I went. You know, she if she wasn't with me, she knew where I was going. So you at know, any and, point in time, you never felt threatened by Dahmer? In, in no that. way. In no way. In no way. Did I ever... Suspicious? Yes. You know, I allow... Okay. We allow what, him... What, 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 it's interesting. What kind of suspicions and why? The thought crossed my mind that the smell was... Smell was smell was um, a little bit more than his freezer going on the blink with soured milk. I mean, with soured meat, because it really sounded, it really smelled bad. Mm. And the thought crossed my mind, and I right away said, "Oh hell no, no, no way, no way, no way." And th that's what I thought. No way. But the thought, so that, did, yeah, the thought ran ran across my mind about that smell being a little bit more than what he was saying. You know, so I look at, I, in, in, in hindsight, you know, would, would you have done something different? Like when you had that tingling thought, okay, this is something suspicious. What would you have done different? Right now, right now, I can't say that I would have done anything different because I did what I did. You know, I can't say, I, I you know, like like damn, going out and doing something wrong and then your ass up in jail. You know, you say you you wish you had stayed at home. Mm -hmm. You know, I wish I had stayed at home. You know, and now you sit you in the paddy wagon on your way to jail. You know, and your first thought may have been to stay at home, but you neglected to follow that thought. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Right. So right now, I don't go there. I really don't go there because. There's nothing that I could have done, you know, because it happened the way it did. You know, I can't, I, I, I don't go there. You know what I'm trying to do, say? Do, do, yeah. do, do, do tell me. I mean, you, you talk about the Oxford Apartments to, so much. It was a special neighborhood. Like a people, people sort of think that it was like the Cecil Hotel, right? Like uh, Cecil Hotel was so uh, infamous. G Richard Ramirez lived there. There are so many serial killers who went there, and it was like in and out. Was next to Skid Row. This what made Oxford Apartment different? It was it, it was pre predominantly uh, African American, you know, ha habitant. You, you, you explained that in the book as well. He was the only white guy in the entire apartment and, but, and, what? And, and, and the building single white guy yeah he was the only yeah, one the okay building. now now just so you know i give praise to the oxford to the oxford apartments to mm -hmm. to the staff to the staff as well as the management you know mm -hmm. the apartments were nice there was no graffiti on the walls none of that mm -hmm. there was no drug there, there was no one selling drugs outside or within mm -hmm. the building, that wasn't going on. The the tenants, we came together after after the Dahmer situation. We all came together, but before that, we had a positive rapport with each other and our passing. If you understand what I mean, you know, mm -hmm. seeing someone, you would be they, they would be polite, you know. And just knowing that this was one of the better buildings, we stood a little bit higher than where we lived being in Drug City. Hmm. You know, you because know, Milwaukee at that time was so. I mean, I mean, it like drugs were rampant. I, I presume. exactly. Yes, yes, yes. I came across. I, I stepped over. I I stepped over a body where a guy had got killed and, and it really made me sad because he died in the curb in, of the street. In the building? Okay. Yeah, oh, he, the... he died in the curb of the streets. And although I did not know this man ah. and I'm standing there and I'm looking at him dead in the street while, while, while they're, while, while they're getting ready to take his body away. And I'm watching this man and I may have seen him a couple of times, but never had words with him. But I'm seeing him land in the, and he's laying on the street in the curb, on between the street and the sidewalk. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I'm right, man. I felt so bad, man. I felt so bad because this was someone that I didn't know, but just the way that he had died. I think he got shot, but there oh, were a man. lot of murders going on in that area. 
it, it, was, it, was, it was it was really bad. Imagine what Dahmer was, you know, the 17 people. Wow. Oof. Yeah, it was really bad. And then with Dahmer doing his thing, you know what I'm saying, in, in, in a drug in, in a drug infested area, you know, mm. I mean, he he kind of blended in. And that was that was one of the questions. Do you you know maybe he strategically chose that place because he thought that this was no, you know, for his, but, no, but he said no, no, he no, 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 no. He did not. He he did not have plans to move into the Oxford apartments and start killing people. It wasn't like that. He would have killed. Know? Yeah, he killed in his grandma's. You know. Yeah, place. yeah. But what I'm saying is though, what what I'm saying is though, he was he was already programmed for killing, and and moving into the and moving into the Oxford apartments was. A convenience. I mean, that's the way it, he was looking for somewhere cheap. He was looking for somewhere cheap, somewhere clean. And and in the Oxford apartments, you know, they made the, and then him being a single white guy with a job, you know, he paid he paid the rent in the security deposit, and he 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 was excellent, an uh, excellent tenant. You know, who knows what his arterial motives were? You know, right. Right, right. You know, but but he moved in there, you know, because because it was affordable, and it right. was a clean building. You know, he did it, it, it wasn't scummish. Did mention that he worked at the Ambrosia Chocolate Factory at that time. Was yes, that far away? Well, is that far away from the? Well, well, he, he he would catch the bus, use the bus for transportation because he didn't have a vehicle, and um, I I'm thinking that. Depending on what time he got off after his third shift in the morning, what time he got off, I think that 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 he either caught the bus or he walked. It was it, it, it may have been less than a mile for him to walk. Less than a mile. Less, less than a mile for him to walk. Therefore, by walking, that's why he would take the back entrance cutting through people's yards and through, through the alley and things like that to get to the back door instead of using the front door, walking around the building to go to the front. It was quicker for him to come through the back, if you follow what I'm saying. I get, so I get he, what you He, he wouldn't walk all the way to the front door to come, to come through the front, you know? You know, right. walk around the building, walk around the building to come to the front door when he can come right up through the back landing. And that's the way that he brought in his his victims. Let me ask you this. Oxford apartment got demolished. Uh, but prior to its demolition, there was a period that you went back to that apartment. I mean, of course, police escorted you out. Everybody, escort, you know, they escorted the entire building out because of the hazardous, like hazmat yeah. had to intervene and all of that, right? Right, so right. My question is, there was a point of time, like you went there, went back there for about a month. You stayed there for about a month after yeah. the incident happened. Yeah. What was your experience around that? Because you you were still, you went back to the same apartment, the, the, right across the hall, the 17 people got killed, like, not 17 people, but a lot of people got killed over there. Uh, okay, let, okay, let, okay. Let me say this. I'm gonna start from the beginning of when they let us back into the apartment, and I want right. to say to any anybody that's watching, you got to read my book. Okay. Okay. So when so when we they they evacuated us out of the apartment building at maybe twelve twelve thirty one o'clock a.m. in the morning, and we weren't allowed back in until seven thirty in between seven thirty and eight o'clock the next morning, and there was a kennel. By by Dahmer's door, they had put the put the yellow tape up saying that you couldn't enter, and they put a padlock on his door, and they had a cooking kennel sitting out sitting outside his door, a small one. You know, it, it was it wasn't too big. You know, let me get my hands right. It was about that big. You know, a kennel, silver kennel, and it was sitting outside his door. So we were just allowed back into our apartments. And so on the way to his to my apartment, there were two detectives standing outside of his door. And when I when I got ready to step inside my apartment, 
one of the one of the detectives started to talk to me. And through talking to him, he asked me to guess what was inside of the little cooking kennel that was out sitting by his door. And I frankly told him straight out, man, I've been out up all night. I'm not in no position to want to guess about anything. Just tell me. So he <laughs> said that he, he said that there were two severed hands, two severed hands cut off at the wrist, and there was also a penis. Ah. Uh, yeah, uh, man. Inside the kennel. You know, so I mean, you know, I, I was like, wow, man, two severed hands. And then he showed me how he how how, how they looked like that, cut off at wow. the wrist. And they were like like claws, you know, because uh, rigor mortis yeah. had set in, you know. And then I thought at the same at that time when he said that there was a severed penis, I thought about when when that night I had heard Wendy, who's in the documentary, and I did not know her name until the documentary, where she had said. When she came, and her documentary is on point because they let her, they they let her come in, and I got to yeah, and I got to hear her comments, and when she came in, and I guess she saw that saw 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 that cooking pot, and she commented to one of, to one of the detectives that the penis severed penis was bigger than his, <laughs> you know, or something. They, they, they did a joke. You know, they said a joke, but but at the time I had no idea for what she was looking at. She only said it's bigger than yours, you know, or something uh, like that. You know, something like that along that line. It's in my book. Right. Yeah, it's in my right. book. But it's it's interesting. What do you like on a on a serious note? Oxford apartment had so many memories. Uh, not only for you, for everybody who lived there. Uh, from your point of view, what what should have that place be? You know, it's now demolished. There's only an empty lot out there. It's a green lot. What do you think it should have been turned into? Maybe a memorial? Uh, well, some sort well, of well, park. Well, they, they had stated they had stated at the time that they were going to make it a memorial. In my opinion. I think that they should get with the with the victims' families and let and let sit down with them and decide what should be done. You know, let let, let them have a voice in it. Splendid. Splendid. Yeah, I think I, I think that they should be the ones to decide. The victims. Yeah, the the victims' families should be the ones. You know, they they should get together with the victims' families and then discuss what they think should be done and let them decide. Interesting. Coming back to uh, one of the pages, I think page 25, you described the first time you met mm -hmm. Dahmer. Uh, he was wearing a jeans, a Finel shirt, and casual shoes. You described, and I guess the, world, the, the word I would choose to describe my impression of him is intelligent, highly intelligent. He had a slim build, appearing uh, to be six feet tall, uh, weighing maybe 165 pounds. I yeah. guess his uh, age would be 30, 31 years old. He was very good looking. Uh, but at the same time, he had no emotions at all. Didn't you? Did you notice that? Because everybody noticed that you know when the trials happened, and you know, remember one of the sisters screamed at him, and he had no emotions. I agree. But was he yeah. was he able to like put on an put on a face with you? Maybe he tried to pretend that he had some emotions with you or with the neighbors. I think that. I was the only one that he really associated with. And I really think that his emotions toward me were genuine hmm. for being, for being someone that he liked, you know, you know, with, with boundaries, of course, you know, boundaries but then at the different. same yeah. time, he's keeping me, keeping me at bay, hmm. you know, but, but I think that his emotions with me were genuine and I never thought, never, never think. I don't. I don't think that he considered me 
as for being one of his victims because we never got romantic with each other or nothing like that. He never offered me anything to drink, you know, or nothing like that when I was when I when I when I would go and sit with him. And I think I've sat with him, I think I sat with him maybe three or four times inside was, of his apartment. What did you talk about? But this was around um, like this was before the killing happened, though. Yes, yes, yes. Before the before the killing and toward the end when his apartment started to smell really bad. So around you that know, time you met him, you, you went into the apartment around that time? Oh yes, I yes, I was there several times, you know, inside of his apartment. You know, I was so he, he came you, to our he came inside our apartment as well. You know what do you what do you guys talk about? Just kicking up shit, talking about nothing. You know what I'm saying? Just being neighbors, getting friendly with each other. You know, that's about all. You know, in fact, I did an art there's an article printed in the Esquire magazine by me, and it's called Check this out. A beer and some chips with Jeffrey Dahmer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I wrote that article and, and it's in the Esquire magazine. And and and, and they, they took a few paragraphs from my book where I thought I had met a friend that I could watch watch football with and have some beer and some chips. You know, get to get away from Pam. You know, I, I you know, I wasn't hanging out with anybody, you know, just my neighbor right next door. How convenient. I mean, you across did, the hall. You, you go you went out with him to on, on a match or something? Sort of thing? No, Had nothing like that. I'm just saying that I wrote an article about about him, about, about having a friend across the hall. To have some beer and chips. That's the title of the that's the title of my article that's in that, that that's in the Esquire magazine that I wrote. They took they took five chapters from my book and they made they made their own story. And that that was the feeling that I had when I met him, that I had met a friend. You know what I mean? Somebody I could have some beer and chips with. Hmm. You know? Yeah. But but going into his apartment, you know, we would talk about nothing really. Not nothing worth nothing worth repeating, you know. And I don't think that at the time that he was doing the killings when, when we first met, he hadn't killed anyone because the smell started maybe four, four to six months after after I met him. That's when the smell started. And I think well, before that time, I, I, I think know. I was I, I think I may have been in his apartment twice during the time when the smell was really bad. So around that really time, bad. did, you, did yeah. you see any change of behavior in that four or five months? Uh, the, I, I do imagine, uh, you, yeah, you, you mentioned the peephole incident yeah. uh, in the documentary as well. As well as yeah. there was an incident that you, you, were, you heard him through the door, through his door. He was cursing at somebody oh, or something. Yeah. Like that. yeah. Would you like to explain that a little bit? Yes, I would. I'm glad you brought, I'm glad you brought that to light. Um. With him there, you know, I, I was working a job where I had to go to classes after the job to take up AutoCAD, hmm. which is drafting by with the computer. OK, so I, I didn't know that. So I so I had to take up classes doing that. And so my classes were Tuesday and Thursday after work. And I would get home maybe about seven o'clock. So this one particular Tuesday, I came in. And I heard a saw. Hmm. You know, I heard a saw going. Please check oh. out my book because this is in my book. I heard the saw going. And so I went inside my apartment. I just kept going and going inside, went inside my apartment. And when I stepped inside, I asked Pam, I said, wow, what, 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 what is he doing across the hall there? And she said that she had seen him bring in some materials she didn't really be pacific and she thought that he was building a bookcase that's what she thought but just keep in mind man you ain't got a saw to, to build no bookcase you know nowadays you know even back then you know they come where you just put it together but that was her answer and so wednesday went by and then thursday my next class hmm. and i came in through the back door where that's, that, that's better than coming through the front door because I'm closer to my apartment where I don't have to come through the front, you know? Same for him. And so I came in 
And I came through the first door, and as I was nearing my apartment, which is right across the hall from his, I could hear him saying, motherfucker, see what you made me do? That's exactly what he said. Motherfucker, see what you made me do? Uh, maybe yeah. to one of his victims. Okay. Yeah. So, 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 so right away, I hear this, and I, and I said, damn, who, who is he talking crazy to? I just couldn't imagine him talking like that in that tone of voice to someone without them defending themselves. So I wanted to hear the rest of the conversation. I wanted to hear, his, hear, hear that person's feedback because I'm thinking I'm fit to hear, hear, hear Jeff get his ass kicked. So I, I stepped to his door and I, and I put, my, put, put my ear by the door where he can't see me through the peephole. So it got very quiet. Nothing, nothing. I heard no more. Didn't drop silence, yeah. Yeah, complete silence. So then I said, maybe after about five seconds, I stood there. The person didn't respond, you know. So I said, okay, cool. So I went, I went inside my apartment, and I closed the door. And then I think I may have told Pam what I just heard, you know, and let it go. But it, it never thought, it always puzzled me as to how he knew that I was standing at his door. And it's taken me almost 30 years to see how far ahead this man was, a, was ahead of me. Okay. He heard me. He heard. He knows. He knew my schedule. So that when I came through that first door, he heard that door, that door slam. So here he, here he is. He, he just heard the door slam. And now he's in the process of hearing the door slam, of swearing at, I'm thinking of a severed head on his table. The head they found in the freeze, in, in, his, in his refrigerator. That's what okay. I'm thinking. That he's talking to this head on his on his kitchen table because I could hear him so clearly. He's got to be somewhere close. He's not in his living room and he's not in his bedroom. He's got to be in the kitchen right there by his apartment door. Hmm. And so while while he's saying, "Motherfucker, see what you made me do," the door slams, and he hears me coming down the hall. So now, what is he waiting for? I'm asking you, what is he waiting for? That's why he got quiet. What is he waiting for? To confront Come on, come on, come on, come on. Stay with me. Well, what is he waiting for? I don't know. He, he's, well, waiting to, he, he's waiting to hear that other door slam oh. for me going into my apartment. Oh, oh right, right. He's waiting, he's, he's waiting to hear that other door slam. And he, he didn't hear it. That's how he knew I was standing by his door. Right. Right. He was really very sneaky, very yeah. cautious about these things. Yeah. But yet yeah. he was an alcoholic, right? He, he used to drink so much. Did he like he, did, before the killing, he used to drink that much as well? No, no. Sober. He, he was sober. He was being very responsible and everything. You know, but I think that um, after he messed up and um, lost his job, hmm. and he and he lost his job because he had killed someone, and and he had to take care of that body, and body, that was yeah, the, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and he lost his job where where he where where they gave much a, ch a chance and he blew it. I think that at that time, that's when he became out of control. He lost it, you know, and then then they, then the smell the smell was taken well, had taken control of the building. He lost his job. He's killing people. He's storing storing the bodies. You know, he became overwhelmed, and I, and I really think that he just didn't care no more, man. I really think that he didn't care. You know, it's interesting again. In page twenty three, you mentioned I thought it would be. A little strange that my neighbor across the hall, who was the only white guy, single male, living in the building and rarely had any visitors. I mean, what was strange about the guy 
was I never saw him associating with anyone. I would see him coming to or living, uh, leaving his apartment. It would be several weeks before Pam and I uh, would have any kind of conversation with him. Loneliness. Uh, and again, we talk about, uh, you know, in, in, um, in Britain, there is a, in London, actually, there is a, there's another killer called Dennis Nielsen. Uh, people say that he is the, that, you know, British version of uh, Jeffrey Dahmer because he also mentioned a lot of loneliness and he also, he had many similarities. Like they both served uh, in uh, the military and all of that. Loneliness is a thing that, that, that takes place in everyone's life, right? Everybody deals with that demon. Do you think you know, that mental state exists in everyone, that, that, that sick, macabre state exists in everyone's mind? No, I do not. Because you have some people that, you know, will go out of their way to help you if they can, even if they're lonely. You know, that gives them fulfillment to help others. You know, just because you're lonely don't mean you want to hurt somebody. You feel what I'm trying to say? Yeah, just because you're lonely don't mean you want to hurt somebody. You know, as far as putting Jeffrey Dahmer in that category, you know, I think that for me looking at him, I believe that, first of all, he was a human being and he had problems. You know, he had problems. And right. at the same time, he was trying to fit in but yet and still, he had secrets. Macabre secrets. You know, and everybody's got secrets. I got secrets, literal, you got secrets. You know, you got skeletons. secrets. Literal come skeletons. On, come, 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 on, come on, come on, tell, tell me. You got secrets. Don't you? Because yeah. I know I do. Everybody we got secrets. We both got secrets, but, but, they're, the difference but, is, but, but, but they're not macabre. Exactly. The difference yeah. is he had literal skeletons in his closet. <laughs> exactly. But the, yeah. Yeah. It's 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 difficult to to understand a mind like that, and I guess a lot of people have been trying to understand if that sort of mental state. I, I I'm not going to be surprised. It, you know, United States is so concentrated with serial killers. It's interesting because. United States is number one in the entire world in terms of serial killers. Number two is Britain, the Great Britain. And the difference between number one and number two is huge number, like in thousands and hundreds. That's the sort of numbers. So do you think that this, this, this is an epidemic of some sort? And, you know, keep in mind that you have witnessed some sort of, you know, this firsthand. Now that you see another random guy walking down the street, do you see, hmm, I don't know. Do you have that thought? No, I, no, I, I don't go that deep, man. I really don't. You know, I look at it as something that occurred in my life where I lived across the hall from this serial killer, you know, and I look at it, look at it, and I summed it up to say that you have good people and you have bad people. And what, and what is in the dark will come to the light. That's the way I look at it, you know, because I don't know what my neighbor is doing once he goes inside of his house, nor does he know what I'm doing, you know. But what's in the dark will come to the light if you do it long enough and you get caught. And your secrets, right. and, and your secrets will be known. True. Vernell, yeah. on that note, one final question and it's about the series Monster. Have you seen yeah. it? Of course I have. So given the fact that you, like, first off, I want you to explain why didn't they, they reached out to you? No, for they did the not. No, no, they did not. They did not reach out to me. They reached out to you for the documentary. But that the had same company, but, but two but different. Not, I, I'm thinking that it was two different indices. Because they, they didn't apply any of in, anything about me to, to that documentary. Why, why I mean, didn't I'm sorry, they do I'm that? sorry to the think, movie, to the movie. Why why do you think uh they they didn't do it? I don't know. Maybe they would have had to give me some money. I don't know. <laughs> Let me ask you one again. Can you can you sum up few mistakes 
well, there are many mistakes in the in Monster. But what yeah. what are the major ones? Do you think? Of course, Glenda, and except for that, how many how many mistakes do you count? I can only go with the mistakes that I'm aware of, and that was during the time of his arrest. You know, as far as what happened when he was a kid and his and his life story, I don't have no idea about that. But from what right. I witnessed, from what I witnessed, and then I'm looking at the movie. I'm thinking that the movie was like reading a comic book. Okay. You know, I mean, I mean, I mean, you, you can never believe what you see in a movie. And they proved this part by, by putting Glenda next door to him when she never lived in the building. At all. And, yeah. and, and then, and then had him offering her a sandwich That and coming in, and coming into her apartment, he 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 would never knock on knock on anyone's door. If he knocked on someone's door, it was my door, and that was wow. to get a cigarette to, to get a cigarette, and to ask me if I had a cigarette while he go walk to go buy him some or whatever. And then the time that he got that he got robbed, and I think I had him over one 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 other time other than that. You know, and then secondly, when he was incarcerated, this what really made me made me giggle was that when he was incarcerated, they were sending him cash, and there's no way that you can get cash when you're incarcerated. And I also want to stress this that this very important fact, from my belief, is that Jeffrey Dahmer was set up for his murder. He was set up. Scarver, I was incarcerated with Scarver, hmm. and I went with Christopher Scarver, and I want to say that I spoke to him on several occasions, which came to an end very quickly when I saw that this man was everybody, there, there was nobody home. And I don't understand why they had him incarcerated in population when he had a mental disease. The man was a killer and Jeffrey Dahmer was put amongst killers when Jeffrey Dahmer was a murderer. Okay, there's a difference in a murderer and a killer. A murderer was Jeffrey Dahmer. Once, you, once he got you into his web, which was his apartment, and if, you, if he offered you a drink and you drank it, then you were going to be dead. Hmm. Okay? You weren't coming out of his apartment. But with, but with Christopher Scarver, him being a killer, mind you, not a murderer. Him being a killer, if he wanted to kill Scarver was the Scarver was the guy who killed Dahmer. That, that, exactly. Scarver was the guy that killed Dahmer. No, you, you had a, you you met him. You, you yes, had I a... did. Yeah, yes, I was incarcerated with him. Did not he, not next, he... not 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 next door to him or nothing like that. But I would see him whenever we had, you know, like Rex. Did you talk to him? Did you mention him that something like that? Excuse did me. You, did you, did you talk to him? Did he mention that? Oh, you know, I, I lived next to that guy that you killed. Yes, uh, I met. No, no, no. I I didn't. I, I met him before he killed Dahmer. Oh, okay. Okay, a few years before he killed Dahmer, when I was incarcerated. Wow. Okay, and he was the type of person to be avoided. You know, you would see to him, you would see that he that no one was home, and you know, you had no idea what was on his mind. Now, let me continue what I was saying. By him being a killer, if he met, if Christopher Scarver met you, and he had an inkling to kill you. He's he going to kill that. you. He's going to kill you the first opportunity that he gets. I think he, Where, he also wrote a book about that. Yeah, about yeah he, he, I'm, I'm going to tell you now, the man is not capable of writing a book. Someone <laughs> wrote that book for him. Okay. He, he's not capable of writing. I hope that he, he did. He I, I hope killed. that he did write it. I hope that he did write it. You know, right. but right now, He's somewhere in Texas he's or somewhere. trying to say that, okay, he's in Texas. Yeah, please continue. Yeah, he, yeah, he's incarcerated in Texas where they've had that man in, in solitary confinement for over 15 years. Which, so you're saying with, that, with, that this guy not, who killed... With, with, without any therapy, he's not getting any help. 
So you're saying the guy who killed Jeffrey Dahmer is no messiah? No, he's not. He 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 need help. He he's a murderer. He's a murderer. He would have killed anybody else. Oh hell uh, yeah! Under... First chance he got. My God. Yeah, if they but would. Maybe something. It, 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 it didn't have to be Jeffrey Don Jeffrey Dahmer Dahmer Jeffrey Dahmer and Anderson that he killed. If he would have been left alone with anyone. It would have been the same results. It just happened that but in the in the series they they sort of portray that he he got a revelation from God. He 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 wrote a you know he's heavily Christian and then he he got he he got he went on to the library. He searched what Dahmer did and he discussed it by it. And that's why he seek vengeance on behalf of God. That's what what portrayed. So you're saying that oh. that's BS. Yes, I am. If you Right now, if they put if they put me and you, me and you, along with him, you know, we it, it would be the same results. If they would put you and I along wow. with him in a maximum security prison, you better watch your back. Okay. A, a, wow. Around him, you better watch your back. He was that type. Of, he was that type of guy, and I think that the guards that left them unattended, unattended, were aware of that. Because they're in a maximum security prison, and a max actually Columbia prison is a max. Dahmer, Dahmer chose to be in gen, gen pop. Yeah, in general so, population, which which I can understand. You know, I mean, who wants to be locked up twenty twenty three hours a day? You know, gotcha. take your chances, and that's what he did. Gotcha. Yeah, gotcha. Brunel, it has been an interesting conversation with you. I know for a fact. You know, this this would shed light on a lot of unknown facts about Dahmer. I thank you for being here today. One last thing. Do come clean on this. Was Dahmer robbed or not robbed? You you sort of like one time you said that you I was just like clear clarity. Was he robbed in the apartment 213? Was he robbed no. somewhere else? No, he, he, he was he was robbed both times walking from work. Okay. Walking yeah, but 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 he was not injured, you know. I mean, they, he they just didn't gave away, him. gave yeah. away them, gave away their money. Okay. Yeah, yeah, you know, he he was not injured, and it happened two times where he was walking from work, and he got robbed. He definitely had a cowardly tendon like stance to him, right? No, 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 no. I wouldn't say it was cowardly. I would say that it was a point that that it was where, you know, being black. And being in and being in, in a black community like we were, with him being being the only single white guy, you know, if he didn't have what you wanted, you know, you leave him alone. You know, after a while, you see the same with the prostitutes. He would walk past the prostitutes that would be on Wisconsin Avenue, and they would be catcalling at him, and he uh -huh. would keep looking straight ahead. He wouldn't even acknowledge them. No so emotion. after so so after so long, you know, two or three days of this, they know not to say nothing to him, you know. And after robbing him once or twice, the word passes that he don't got nothing. So leave him alone. You know, it's not like you know he had three or four hundred dollars in his in his wallet. You know, to rob him, you know, you'd be lucky to get anything. You know, he he was just like everybody else. So 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 right. he so he so he did fit in. Black people are very accepting. We are very accepting. We we don't judge. You know, we we don't judge. So he was accepted. Right. Yeah. Brunel, it has been a phenomenal conversation. I I know for a fact that my audience would gain a lot of insights into the unknown facts of Jeffrey Dahmer case. I have an no entire note and here, here, but let me tell you something, guys. You got to have to check out his book. And this is the cover of the book, Across the Hall, all right, Vernell Bass. If you're in the United States, you can find it in Lulu. And the, the link to that will be down below, Barnes and & Nobles and New Lulu everywhere. You can find it. If you're in India or somewhere else, uh, you can find, you can check out the book on Google Books, a few Preview pages are uploaded over there. If you like what you're seeing, 
buy the book from somewhere like Flipkart or somewhere else, you know, like that. Vernell, uh, do you want to say anything uh, before you go? Any passing words, any message for the future generation for um, being more vigilant? I would like to say that living the experience that I lived and having written my book to share my story, I just want you to know that it's best, man, when you, if, if, if you see something, say something. You know, if you suspect something, say something. And you're going to see that in my book that we did call the police about the smell, but they broke into the wrong apartment that was empty. And Pamela did find out where the smell was coming from, which was across the hall. But I just want to say, you know, if you're living in an apartment building and if you suspect something and you have a notion, go with that notion, which I did not do. Go with that notion. And I want to thank you, man, for having me on your show. And um, I appreciate talking with you and I want to keep in touch with you. And it's been, a, pl it's been, been a pleasure, man. More podcasts to come on this because this will be chopped up and given to your YouTube feed. So check out Send Vernell Love. Do not stalk him. I know a lot of people will stalk him now after the documentary. I was one of the stalkers, but I, I'm not a stalker. I'm a journalist. It's not stalking when you have a press card. Somebody asked me that yesterday on, um, on Clubhouse. How did you get to find the find out this guy? Like I watched the documentary and it stalked him, but it's not stalking because I'm a journalist. So yeah, right. cool. I, I just want everybody to know that I'm not hiding. You know, um, if if you want to talk, you know, uh, I'm on Facebook. I'm not hiding from anyone. You know, um, if you want if you want to just kick it, you know, hit me up. Yeah. Every, any future podcasters watching this, subtly reach out to them. Do read his book because. You know, you have to give something, you know, you have to buy, purchase the book, give a little bit of value and respect to this gentleman because he did pour out his heart. This book is a masterpiece, probably better than most of the films and documentaries I've made on him. So if you're really a true crime fan, highly recommend it. I read the entire book. It's phenomenal, filled with amazing stories. I didn't, I left out a lot of portions out, you know, knowingly because I wanted you guys to read it. So Vernell. Much love to you, man. Wish you all the success. This is not the end. Stay healthy. You have a beautiful family. I know for that, for sure. Uh, take care of them. And I wish you all the best. Okay. Hey, everybody. Everybody. Peace. Peace. Yeah, I'm out, man. <laughs>